Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Well, shares of Whirlpool are trading higher today. This is the company that owns the Maytag and KitchenAid brands, had its uh, annual investor day and shared how it's counting on small appliance businesses to help turn around sales. Whirlpool shares up by six tenths of 1% right now. All right, so let's talk a little bit about strategy and the business outlook and how the consumer is doing. Let's get to the interview. Great to have back with us. Whirlpool Chairman, President, CEO and COO, Mark Bitzer. Uh, he's joining us from the New York Stock Exchange where he presided over the company's investor day. Mark, uh, so good to have you back with us. Hope you are well. Um, Let's start a little bit broadly because we got some U.S. consumer confidence news um, down in February for the first time in four months. Americans' views deteriorating about the outlook for the company, the job market, and financial conditions. What signs of strain and stress are you seeing specifically when it comes to consumers? How would you describe them? So, so Carol, first first of all, thanks for having me back on your show. Yeah. Um, let me maybe talk, I mean, obviously our uh, purchase like a durable appliance is, is heavily driven by consumer confidence and housing in general. So what we did see already the last year is that actually our replacement side of a business where people just expl- um, replace a product under the rest, that has been very strong and even up. But the discretionary side, we actually already last year saw coming back, coming down. Um, large as a result of interest rates rising, housing kind of being very slow and slowing down throughout the year, that ultimately depressed the the discretionary side. So what you're describing, we saw already last year, and we probably, I mean, in our earnings call also, we said it's probably going to be around us, certainly for Q1 and Q2. Um, And then we need to see what happens if interest and mortgage rates and everything else. But I think there there needs to be a catalyst from that side to really lift consumer sentiment. Well, what would that catalyst be, Mark? Like, what are you looking for at the perch of Whirlpool? Yeah, I mean, in particular for a North American business, which, you know, there's there's a strong correlation with uh, existing Mm -hmm. home sales and housing market in general. Um, We always we shouldn't forget that, you know, the average mortgage rates, which are right now locked in with homeowners is 3.7 percent. So I think to really bring supply on the market and getting people ready to sell their existing homes, I think you need to see mortgage rates, you know, certainly below 6%, probably more like 5.5% to really kind of unfreeze the market again. Because, you know, what we saw the last two years is the market pretty much dropped from 6.4 million existing home sales to 3.8. That's a dramatic drop. Um, we call it a shock freeze. Um, and it takes that momentum or the catalyst on the interest rate side to kind of unfreeze or fall the market. And, and that's what we, I mean, we don't see it short term. I mean, and of course, well, everybody's got to watch what the Fed will do. Um, but I think over time, it will kind of be a key catalyst for growth. So make that that connection for our investor audience about that key catalyst here and, and why a person who is sitting at a 3.5, uh, 3.75% mortgage won't necessarily go out and buy a new appliance from Whirlpool. But if they were to sell that home to somebody at a favorable mortgage rate, that person moving in would then buy a new appliance from Whirlpool. Why wouldn't the person who lives there now end up buying it if it actually need, if they actually need a new washer or dryer? Yeah. So, so again, I mean, if it just needs a new wash and dryer, we would see that as a replacement market. And, and you know, it's again, if you break down and let me zoom out a little bit, break down our fundamental demand. Our demand has replacement, has discretionary and new homes. These are basically our fundamental free demand drivers. Replacement is very strong because what we've seen post-COVID um, and of certain during COVID, people spend more time at home. So the appliance usage is higher. High usage rates drive earlier replacements. So that side of business is very strong. We see that today. But, the, but what is right now soft is the discretionary side, which in particular comes with existing home sales. And over many decades, what we typically saw kind of the, the mon- month before and the month after people buying a new home or existing home, that's when you have increased purchase and appliance and everything. So, so because what we typically see with people moving in, one of the first things they might do is replace the kitchen or at least replace the appliances. So, so that part of the demand is today missing. And again, it's, it, Think about yourself. If you're a homeowner, you're locked in at 3.7 um, rate. I mean, it's are you willing to to kind of refinance or buy a new home where mortgage rate right now is 6.8 or 6.9 no. <laughs> percent? Uh, chances are low. Okay, that's right now what we see in the market, and you can't blame the consumer for that. Mark, I feel like you're describing me. You know, we bought a new hot water heater because we had to. We didn't have a choice, right? That was replacement. Um, we thought about maybe purchasing something else new that we didn't need to, and discretionary. And we said, you know, we're gonna not do it right now. So, like, I totally get what what you say um, is going on. Having said that, then let's. Talk 
talk a little bit about your investor day and some of what you're doing. Uh, our team writing up how you guys are going to focus are, are, are focusing on smaller appliances. It seems to be maybe what consumers are willing to spend money on. The margins are better. Talk to us a little bit about that strategy and how it can move the needle, especially when it comes to top line growth and margin growth. Yeah. So, so Carol, what we what we spoke about is, you know, as a company, we've been in a multi-year what we call portfolio transformation. And what it basically meant is, um, over past decades, we've had a fairly dispersed global business. Um, mm -hmm. We were from China to Chile and all places of the world. And what we've decided on a major business, but we want to focus on the markets where we have an, an undeniable strong position, which offers the Americas, North America, South America. We have good business in India, and that's what we'll focus on. So we, over the years, we sold off the majority of our China business. We sold off Russia. And right now, we're just in the kind of final weeks before we can close our European transaction, where we would only have a, a smaller portion of the business. So with that, we have a fundamentally different business portfolio. One, essentially, of it's the major business in the Americas and India. And we have our small domestic appliance business. That was... In some ways, you could describe it as a hidden gem from the past because it was hidden in, in the segment report results of all the different regions. But if you look at that, that is probably, um, it's our strongest brands. It has passion across all demographics and age groups. Um, and we, we feel we have a license to grow that business, um, certainly from a consumer perspective. So, um, and a lot of our resources going forward will go into our small domestic appliance business because it's certain one which we love strong margins and an exceptionally strong consumer position. How small or what percentage is, is the smaller appliance business mark right now in terms of revenues and how big do you think it could become if we look at the kind of revenue pie? Yeah, so today it it is quote unquote only a $1 billion business, but mm -hmm. it has 50% EBIT margin. So it's a very margin attractive business. Um, but you know, our presence in if you look at the categories of small domestic appliances, it's largely small, it's largely stand mixers and associated products. But we have so much opportunity to grow in coffee, and we just announced today also we will bring a fully automatic espresso maker in May this year um, in other parts of business. So we strongly believe there's ample opportunity to grow that business. Hey, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, cost cutting that you're targeting right now across the different uh, business lines after incurring significant increases back in 2022 and in 2021, Mark. Um, where within the business are you finding these savings? Yeah, so first of all, to put it in context, it's, you know, in the COVID years, we basically had more than two, two and a half billion of additional costs. That was a big inflation wave, not only raw materials in all parts of the business. Last year, we, we clawed back 800 million of that. And this year, we're targeting over 500 million. So we're not yet even fully back to pre-COVID cost levels. The opportunities which we see this year, and that's a little bit different from last year, we don't see a lot of tailwinds from raw materials. So we pretty much expect steel and oil and everything else to remain rather stable for us. But we do see opportunity on, on cost takeout on products. We do see further opportunities to reduce logistic costs because it's it's a massive cost element for us because we're shipping big bulky products and <laughs> they just drive a lot of cost on the logistics side. But we also look at our overall called overhead and infrastructure. And what I mean with that is, you know, global business required a fairly complex global organization. With a more focus on our Americas, we have an opportunity to radically also simplify how we organize and that also drives some cost savings. I do wonder, too, looking at your balance sheet, we have this really great story, a Bloomberg exclusive today. It's among our most read about how companies who have been so addicted to debt um, are now seeking equity. So thinking about selling shares rather than tapping um, the debt markets if they need money. You guys, what's your plan to do you leverage your balance sheet specifically, which has grown as you've done some acquisitions? Um, and I do wonder if investors can kind of still count on the dividend going forward, the sustainability of the dividend market. And just got about a minute or so left. Yes. So let me first start start straight away with dividend. We paid our dividend for 69 years, 69. Um, and in none of the 69 years, we ever had a dividend reduction. Um, actually, in the, out of the last of the last 10 years, in eight years, we had a dividend increase. So we we are so that's a yes. <laughs> yeah, that is a, well, of course, it, every single dividend payment requires a board approval. But right. I would I would say this statement publicly if I don't feel the board feels very strongly about it. So we are we strongly believe in dividend and we have a funds to pay the dividend and 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 more importantly we have a basic a guideline internally where we say um, over the last three years we look at the average EPS and we typically pay out 30 35 percent of that EPS over the last three years and we're pretty much on on track on this one. 
So more to, so more to the balance sheet is first of all keeping us in mind we have 1.6 billion dollar for cash on hand right. um, that's a public number so what we do want to do and you know we we knew exactly when we acquired the the integrated business in Wisconsin which is hugely margin attractive with a strong position we knew of course it's it's a heavily owned balance sheet and we okay. said two or three years to kind of digest that acquisition related debt we paid last year down 500 million we will pay down this year 500 million. So what we guided today in Midwest today is kind of, yeah, by 26, we want to be roughly in a two two okay. times net uh, at leverage. So we feel Got we're it. on the right path kind of re de risk, if you want to say so, um, and, and use the balance sheet to the levels where we want to have it. So appreciate covered so much ground as you always do. Mark Bitzer, be well. Look forward to uh, always our next conversation. Chief Executive Officer at Whirlpool.